somebody had just had some questions and their question really is just asking for some more information and we're happy to do that too. So you don't always have to say, what's the answer to this question? This person wanted just some more information. So they're dealing with non-face-to-face non-physicians. So wondering about some of those uh, CPT codes as well as kind of modifiers in general. So I started out with, um, you know, modifiers can be pretty tricky. We do have many videos talking about modifiers. If that's an area that you're not dealing very well with, if you kind of forget them or, um, you know, trying to look at, uh, you know, at certain circumstances to use them because there are many, 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 many modifiers out there. You look at the front of the HickPix book and you got that double folded open up page of your HickPix. Those are all modifiers and CPT modifiers. So there's many of them out there and they're all for different circumstances. So you have such like anesthesia and DME and um, billing. So we've got like our um, Medicare waivers and things like that are all modifiers. So in a general assessment, because these face-to-face -face codes were coming from the e &M section, and there's a few in the medicine section. I kind of just said, you know, pretty much what you're looking at is the e &M modifiers. There's only three. So that um, those are the main three to remember because in an office setting, pretty much everybody's going to have an e &M code, uh, depending upon what type of uh, specialty it is. But the e &Ms are very important. And, it, and I don't know how often I see a claim coming in with 99214 RT for right. Well, no, no, you can't put that on an e &M. There's only three modifiers, such as a 24, which is an unrelated evaluation and management during a post-operative period performed by the same physician who did the operative um, surgical procedure. 25, very, very ever important, 25, the significant and separately identifiable e &M. So something totally different on the same day as a procedure by the same physician performing the procedure, as well as 57, your decision for surgery, which is very important. Um, a lot of times uh, people don't understand that some of those, uh, we learn CPT codes, but there's actually a global period attached to CPT codes. So there's possibly a 10-day period or a 90-day period where you can't have an evaluation of management during that period. Well, that which counts as the day before, day of, and 90 days after. So day before, you do an e &M, or the day of, you do an e &M, but that day was your decision for surgery. So those are three extremely important modifiers, and they're only used on an evaluation management code, 99201 through 99215. That's when you're using them and you're inpatient and things like that. So any other modifier you use is going to be appended to a CPT procedure code. So 59, 79, 78, 91, anything else you're going to use is going to go along with a different code from the CPT section. So non-face-to-face -face physician services, um, some of those include your prolonged services, your interprofessional consultations, and your remote or your vital services. So there's actually codes that we can bill when the physician didn't see the patient. So you may not use them very often, it depends on what field you're working in. So the first is our prolonged services. We've heard about these, these are everyone that the physician wants because I spend an extra time with that patient. Well, it has to be documented. You can also have a non-face-to-face prolonged service, which of course physicians would like to use those too. Um, so our example, you have a developmental specialist who's going to be seeing a patient as a new patient. So they have records from their previous providers, counselors, you know, psychologists, school personnel. They may have all of these records that they're reviewing before they see the patient. They want to get a good history and a good feel for this patient. And then after they evaluate the patient, they need to write a report and send it back to that physician, that counselor, that school personnel. So they're gonna bill an E&M 
charge for whatever service they provided that day. And they can also bill a prolonged evaluation non-face-to-face, -face, a 99358. So they were doing a prolonged evaluation of management service before and or after their direct patient care for the first hour. Well, that's 30 to 74 minutes. That's not an hour, but that's how they equate time. And an hour period time is always a little bit different in CPT, and they break that down quite often. So all the time it took him to review those records, write that report, that was non-face-to-face. -face. The patient wasn't there. They weren't in the room. They're able to bill this as well in addition to what they did. Of course, this all requires documentation. So being able to document that they did that. Another non-face-to-face -face is our interprofessional consultations. So we have our uh, patient's treating physician needs the opinion of somebody else or a specialist or one specialist needs to speak to another specialist. So where I'm at, I work with orthopedics. We have a lot of specialists. Well, what if there's a specific procedure that somebody needs done that only a orthopedic in Boston does? Well, they might need to do a consultation. So that's an interprofessional consultation. And these are all based upon time. So there's more than this 99446 code. Um, just to shorten some of these answer sheets, I only included one. But that's five to 10 minutes. So you understand that the other ones are going to be more than that. You have another time frame available. So it's either via the phone or the internet or some kind of EHR assessment. Um, if uh, I work for also a large corporation and once we all are integrated on the same EHR, our physicians in Richmond will be able to see what a physician in uh, Pittsburgh is doing and be able to consult those medical records so they could get a, a different opinion from a specialist in orthopedics, which we do have those two uh, fellows who deal specifically with a particular body part. We have our remote and virtual services. This is not our telehealth service. This is using monitoring devices remotely. You may have heard how, you know, you just dial in your pacemaker and the physician can assess that. So this is similar to that. So one, one example is 99091, the collection and, and interpretation of physiologic data, such as, there's more examples, but one was glucose monitoring. And it's digitally stored and or it's transmitted by the patient or their caregiver to the physician and it requires a minimum of 30 minutes of time every 30 days. So they're reviewing this documentation, they're seeing their glucose level, they're, so they get to bill for that. They didn't see the patient, they're reviewing the data in order to make sure that that patient's uh, health is progressing the way it should be. So there are other non-face-to-face -face services mentioned that include telephone services. So this is, and these get to be very important here when we talk about these telephone services. So 99441 is just one of the examples. Again, they change dependent upon the minutes. This is a telephone evaluation and management done by a physician who may report that service that they provided to an established patient. It has to be established. Remember, a physician's never gonna assess a brand new patient over the phone. They need to see them for that. So this is an established patient, somebody they have a rapport with uh, for a related e &M service provided within the previous seven days, nor is it leading to an e &M service within the next 24 hours or the soonest available appointment. So I have an example. A patient calls their pediatrician with concerns stemming from a visit 10 days ago. So say they were there, they were given an antibiotic, and they said, take this for 10 days. When the mom's going, oh my gosh, that, it isn't working, it's been 10 days, and it's still there. Well, if that physician were to feel that those symptoms, well, yeah, that's typical, they're going to linger. If you still have problems next week, come in. So if they're reviewing this information, they're talking about the signs and symptoms for a five to 10 minute phone call, it can be documented and this physician can bill for that for the patient without actually seeing them face to face. But if they said, oh my gosh, you need to come in here tomorrow, get in here, they can't bill for it 
because it's stemming, it's leading to a service within the next 24 hours, or say it's Friday, or the soonest available, which would be Monday, see if they don't work weekends. So um, that's what they're looking at. If, if it equated anything within the last seven days, or they're going to have them come up for a follow-up. They don't bill for it because they're going to use that information that from that phone call they just had as part of their evaluation and management when they do see them. So they can't bill for it extra. So that's why I used an example of 10-day you know, antibiotic prescription. Finally, we have an online medical evaluation. So this service is online inquiry requiring a timely response. Now, it needs to be determined within your office what's considered a timely response. Say you have a physician who does surgeries a couple of days a week in a hospital. We get that timely response can't come in 24 hours. It needs to come in maybe 48 hours. Um, and permanent storage of that encounter. So it needs to be information that's documented and stored. If it's an online inquiry, it needs to be able to be attached to the EHR system perhaps. And it only reported once every seven days. If it's in relation to that E&M service, then it can't be billed. It will be included as part of that. If they're just saying, oh, I forgot to tell you that I'm taking Tylenol already. Oh, okay, well, that, that's good. They don't need to report that. Um, it just goes along with that E&M that they already billed. So one example is 99444, an online E&M provided by a physician or other qualified healthcare professional who can report E&M services. So we all know not everybody can report E&M services, right? So we need to carefully review the rules of each of these services, and they're all outlined in CPT, because a lot of them say if it's going to be, um, if you're going to come back and be seen in an additional amount of time or a certain amount of time, um, some of the codes were 14 days for that interprofessional consultation. Say you called that doctor in Boston and said, I need to get my patient in there. If they're going to come in the next 14 days, then they don't bill for that because they're going to be seen. Um, and also insurance carriers might have their own guidelines or they may not pay for it. it it's possible that there is no reimbursement policy available for telephone services with Aetna, for example. You know, maybe they just don't even pay them. Um, which we still report them for the statistical reason. We wanna let them know this is how we do business. This is what's done to treat this patient. And so we may not get paid for it, but we're still gonna report it because they might have to make a change in their guidelines then. Wow, we received 200 of these claims in for patients. We might have to start paying for them. Now there are non-face-to-face, non-physician services, which come up with a varied definition. So according to Medicare, an other qualified healthcare professional is defined as your anesthesiologist assistant, a midwife, a nurse anesthetist, um, a nurse practitioner, physician assistant. There's a lot of different um, terms that they use for a other qualified healthcare professional. The CPT says a non-physician is a physical or occupational or speech therapist or a registered dietitian. So there's a little bit of variance there. So it kind of, um, when you talk about non-face-to-face, non-physician services, that's a CPT definition. So they're talking about um, your physical, speech, occupational therapists, and your dietitians. So um, the uh, services are not your office staff, the receptionist, a medical assistant, uh, a technician, um, or and they have to be clinical of nature. They're not calling to discuss something else or some concern or their medical bill. We don't bill for that. It has to be a clinical um, concern. So the American, I found uh, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, they did contact in 2009, they contacted CPT and said, okay, we need some clarification here um, because their clinical staff can report that a registered nurse, they can use that code if then they have to meet all criteria. So if it falls within this, your state 
practice law for that scope of practice for a registered nurse. In established patient protocol, you have a protocol established in your office that this is what we always do. Um, the physician is going to assume responsibility then for what has just been relayed to that patient. And the patient must be established. Again, you can't do a new patient. And all the charges have to originate from that physician's office. It can't go through some outsourced call center. So if it meets all five of those criteria, then yes, even a registered nurse could be considered um, to be able to bill this. And so then I just have those two other codes. They're in the medicine section. Again, telephone services and online medical evaluations, the same as were just described previously, except it's a code for a non-physician. So there's different terminology, depends on who you're billing it to and who you're talking about. Um, it, rather interesting, um, I did a whole bunch of evaluations today online. I can't remember if it's in this answer sheet or the next one that I included it. Um, oh, there it is, yep. The proposed rules for 2020, this link, it's an 808 page document. So if you're totally bored one night and you're you can't sleep and you want something to read, review this. Um, these are the proposed changes for CMS for 2020. And in them, one of them is the state's scope. So we know a lot of uh, physician assistants can't bill for um, particular services with Medicare, but now that might change. So read what they have to say about it, see if it affects your state, and see then if that's something that possibly in the future you might be able to bill for instead of an incident to service. So I just thought I'd provide that. It was rather interesting. I only got through maybe 80 pages of it. So. Do you need more medical certification and business training? Learn more at www.cco.us.